Yeah. yeah. Like, <coughs> I can't uh, so for the life of me see why you call people like, like Corbyn or the modern socialists socialists. socialists. Because, because they, they seem to me to be the yeah, antithesis yeah, of what socialism is about, about which is a concern, concern about human flourishing. So, so for example, example Jeremy Corbyn hates economic, economic growth. growth. Yeah. He, he doesn't, doesn't like it. He, he thinks we can't grow our economies at 6 7% a year like China or even 100 or unlimited economic growth. Sure. And, and if, if you look back to the original socialists like Marx, Marx what, what they, they loved about, about capitalism is, is that, that it grew. It, it produced wonders greater than, than the pyramids. Yes. Marx was totally infused. Yeah, Marx was much smarter than a socialist than the socialists today are. Yes, precisely. So the socialists today hate all the best parts of capitalism, which is a mistake. But the, the thing is that capitalism itself, I mean, you talk about using one's reason, which is a core enlightenment, uh, enlightenment idea, I, I grant you, and that we learn from experience. But the thing about capitalism is that it, it grows and then it falls. It goes into regular crises. And that experience has shown that uh, capitalism doesn't work. And at present, you could even say capitalism is in a rot, in a crisis. We're not growing enough. Yes. So what the challenge we face today, I think, as if, if you would say socialists, is to harness our reason and our knowledge of history to come up with an alternative to capitalism which produces human flourishing consistently. And what, what I think you're doing is giving up on human reason because you are actually accepting a system which you know by experience goes into crisis. And you're saying we should just accept it and not look beyond it. So, so that's my accusation. No, that's, that's, that's good. And it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a relatively original question. I put that one. Um, so that's good. Um, one of the reasons, so just go back to some of the comments you make, and I'll, take them, I'll try to take them all. Uh, the reason I call Corbyn a socialist is because he calls it himself, and people refer to him as a socialist. I, I'm not in the business of deciding who is a true socialist and who is not. Um, and it, because he, he exemplifies certain socialist characteristics, like uh, the nationalization of industries, the, the, the idea of, 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 of putting the state as a central planner over industry, which is a typical socialist policy. Now, I understand why you don't think he's a socialist, and that's, and that's fine, and I'm, I'm willing to accept elements of that. Um, let me just say, and, and I have to say this, uh, uh, I don't believe Marx for one second believed in human flourishing and strove towards human flourishing. I don't think that was his agenda. I don't think he believed it. I think generally Marx was a hater, not a lover, and not somebody who, who really embraced human flourishing. And if you read his letters with Engels, where they describe which people they're going to eliminate and which people they're, they're, they're good. And, I mean, he, had the, he, he, he was one of the most racist, uh, he, Engels in particular, but Marx, of course, endorsed all this, one of the most racist, horrible human beings I can even imagine, and to, to associate him with human flourishing is bizarre. But I'll give you this. Marx projected a system that it calls optimistic about the future. And I think many of today's left are not about the future, and they're not about economic growth, they're not about human flourishing. They are essentially nihilists. And I think that is a characteristic of modern leftist ideology, is nihilism. It's a post-Nietzschean kind of uh, a, a real nihilistic approach uh, to life. And, and, and you can't accuse Marx, at least in that sense, of being a nihilist. I think the results of his ideology are nihilistic. But he at least projected an idea of one day we all come together as the proletarian and live happy, successful, wonderful, prosperous, rich lives. And, and you know nobody today on the modern left actually projects that. Um, I don't agree with you about capitalism C completely. I think the evidence is quite to the contrary of what you suggest. Capitalism does not fail. There is no evidence that capitalism has failed. And I would take you at crisis after crisis after crisis and show you that capitalism has not failed. And today, the sluggish economy of the world is driven by one major factor, and that is statism. The, 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 the lack of innovation, the lack of progress, the lack of, 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 of economic growth today is a complete result of the growth of the state, of the fact that the state today, that spending is consumption, it is wasteful, instead of that money being invested, that money returning to the hands of a the capitalist, they can invest it, they can, they can invest it in production, in, in job growth, in innovation, in creation, in building. So it's the exact rejection over the last 100 years of capitalism that has brought about the Great Depression, that brought about the 2008 crisis, that has brought about the slow economic growth we're experiencing today. And in China, China's a great example, because I know a lot of people on the left, or I don't know if you consider yourself on the left, but, but, but a lot of people who, who want an alternative to capitalism look at China and say, look, they're growing at these astounding rates, and they're run by the Communist Party. Well, 
You have to go look and you have to go to China and actually look at where the growth has happened. The growth and the success of China happens where the Chinese government doesn't pay any attention. When the Chinese government has said, go do whatever you want, we're not going to look over there, we're not going to, take, we're not going to worry about you. That's where the economic growth. In other words, in the areas where they allow for individual freedom, individual innovation, in other words, for capitalism to flourish, those are the areas that have generated astronomical growth, growth that's been held back by the state-owned enterprises and by the central planning of the Chinese government. Every area where the Chinese government has centrally planned has been a disaster. Every area that central government of China has, has, has embraced has not worked. And, and I don't know how many of you know of, of kind of the transition from 79 under Deng Xiaoping to today of Chinese economy, but it's absolutely fascinating. There's a wonderful little book called How China Became Capitalist. Now, I don't like the title because I don't think China's capitalist, but it's certainly not socialist. It's got elements of both, like all countries. Uh, but where it grows are those elements of capitalism. But it's a book by, uh, by, the, by a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics by the name of Ronald Coase, and a Chinese author whose name I can't remember. Ronald Coase was 101 years old when he wrote the book, so it's, it's pretty astounding uh, for that fact. But it's a short book. It's wonderful. It's not the best written book in the world, but it's got fantastic information on how that transformation happened. And i just give you one story of how China became so successful at growing food. In the 1960s, Communal farms generated mass starvation. People died in the tens of millions during the 1960s. That's just a historical fact. Right? And Mao Zedong knew this and basically did nothing, partially because he believed that this was a weaning out process of the weak and so on, but also partially because this was a system. They believed in communal farms and this is what it generated. Anyway, throughout post 1960s, farming in China, farmers in China struggled and starved. There was real hunger in, in those communal farms all over China. And this one little, China, this one little community in China, uh, I forget the name of the village, but this little village in central China, they got together one day and they said, look, this is not working, we're dying. So let's do this. You will pretend that that piece of land over there is yours and this piece of land is mine. And whatever you produce on that is yours and you get to keep the surplus and I'll get to keep the surplus here. And they basically divided all the land of village communally owned into private or pseudo private lots that individuals now cultivated, maintained, and got the surplus from. And guess what happened? Within a year, they were producing massive surpluses. Suddenly, there was plenty not only to feed the village, but they were exporting to other villages. And the central, the, the Communist Party went down there and they said, what the hell is going on here? What have you done? This is great. This is miraculous. We want to do this. And, and you know, the farmers tried to hide it, but ultimately it came out what they done. And the immediate response of the communists was, well, you know, kill these people. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? They're embracing capitalism. And to Deng Xiaoping's credit, now Deng Xiaoping was a really bad guy, but he did some good things here and there. To Deng Xiaoping's credit, he basically said, no, this works. He was a complete pragmatist. He said, this works, so leave it alone. Not only that, if it works in this village, let's see if it works in another three villages. And they tried the same system in another three villages, and guess what? When you give people private ownership, they produce, and they create, and they create surpluses. So it worked over there. And they said, okay, we'll convert all of China's farming, or most of China's farming, to this model, and it's, that's what they did. Even though to this day they don't have private property. They have what I call pseudo-private property. They pretend that they own the land. Uh, the government still hasn't given them full rights over the land. So capitalism works. And, and, and I'm happy to explain the 2008 crisis, and I'm happy to explain the Great Depression, but the fact is that when markets are left alone, they flourish and succeeded. Even today, if you look at where innovation happens, where does innovation happen today? What industry innovates? Of all the industries out there, where, where do you see 8, 9, 10, 12% growth in an industry? Which industry? Technology. Yeah, technology, this industry, right? This industry happens to be the least regulated, the least controlled, the least government influence of all industries. So it grows. And it's left alone. And yeah, is there a bubble? Sure, there's a bubble, but the bubble is self-correcting and immediately it grows afterwards. Right? There was a bubble in 99, and partially funded by the Federal Reserve, a non-capitalist organization, a very statist entity. But after 2001, it grows again. And where don't you get innovation? Well, things like airplanes. We basically fly the same airplanes today as we did 50 years ago. Same engines, the same basic body, 
you know, they make them bigger a little bit and they use fiber or whatever, carbon fiber and stuff like that to make them lighter. But it's the same basic design as it was 50 years ago. Why? Because it's so heavily regulated. And the one innovation we used to have in airplanes was what? What was the one airplane that broke the mold? Concorde. The Concorde. We grounded that. That's gone. Nobody, I mean, there's one company now building a supersonic jet. We'll see if they let it fly. And the same with the automobile, the internal combustion automobile, and the same with every industry where the state regulates. And to call what we have today capitalism is bizarre, given the mountains of regulation, the mountains of state control, the fact that for years at Microsoft, a government official used to sit to sign off on any deal they make, <laughs> or that today, when J.P. Morgan opens the door at, eight, at, at 9 a.m. in the morning, 200 government employees go to work at J.P. Morgan to make sure that they follow all the regulations and do all the rules and sign off on every one of the decisions. So many of industries today have been nationalized without saying they've been nationalized. Basically, the banking sector in the world is, is run by governments. It's not run by private entrepreneurs. So, no, I think we know what the system is that produces human flourishing. We know what the system is that produces human wealth, and that is capitalism. And it doesn't need altering. We don't need a new system. We just need to embrace it fully and consistently, which we've never really done. You mentioned producers, aside from those people who give us intellectual products. What about the businessman? You've talked about capitalism. I'd like to know his role in this. Well, the businessman also is as recent a product as the intellectual. Before the birth of capitalism, there were no professional businessmen, and there were no professional intellectuals. Both the mind and material production and trade were enslaved and ruled by the various combinations of Attilas and witch doctors, which means by a powerful government, by an absolutist type of government, whether it was the feudal absolutism or the absolute monarchies of Europe of the past Renaissance period. In any case, the producers of material goods, the traders, and the producers of ideas, the teachers, philosophers, the early scientists, were men without official status, without a profession, and the total mercy of the political rulers, which means that the mercy of rule by force. Oh. It is only since the Industrial Revolution, the birth of a free society, the society of capitalism, that there was a new class of men, which is the free producers of material goods, the businessmen, the industrialists. They, of course, are the producers, in the strict sense of the word, or should be. But they are the greatest victims of today's society. They are the ones who have been betrayed by modern intellectuals. And in this sense, both businessmen and intellectuals will commit suicide by destroying each other, and the fault belongs to the intellectuals. The businessman is the man who has to use his mind to deal with reality, to study facts, to produce material goods. He is the man who serves as the transmission belt of the discoveries of science uh, and carries the products of science to all levels of society. He is the one who takes the invention of a theoretical scientist or of an inventor, transforms them into useful products, and uh, put, putting them into mass production makes them available to all levels of society. The businessman is the man who has achieved the enormous historically miraculous rise in the standard of living of mankind during the 19th century. He is the one who has lived up to the role of a producer, uh, to the role of a rational, creative man. But the intellectuals have never given him credit for it, have regarded him as if he were an Attila, and being afraid of freedom themselves have been looking from the start of the Industrial Revolution for some form of an Attila to protect them, the intellectuals, against the free market of ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you've been talking about the, the bankruptcy of our, our modern intellectuals, and I know that in your most recent book, this is really a manifesto to a group that you call the new intellectuals. Would you mind telling me just who they are, in your own words, and how they differ from the old-style intellectuals? But since the old style, the presently existing intellectuals have declared their own bankruptcy by abandoning the intellect, what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, 
by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not...